Starting off this countdown, we have the gas mask. More than half a million men were injured or killed by poison gas during World War One. As a result, gas attack countermeasures were put in place, including gas masks. Now, early gases didn't have deadly effects like mustard gas did. The first gas attacks involved tear gas and chlorine gas. Tear gas is obviously irritating but relatively harmless. Chlorine, though, could be incredibly fatal. So troops would use rags or towels covered in urine to protect themselves. This was before proper masks were created. The masks we see here look absolutely terrifying. It's one of the first ones ever invented for soldiers. It did its job until more modern ones were invented. But you can't help but admit that these look hella creepy. Coming in at number 9, we have the creepy sniper uniform. So apparently this is the uniform that snipers would wear during World War I to camouflage in with their surroundings. Now I'm just waiting for the damn comments about what uniform, I can't see anything, all I see is an empty case, hardy har har. Now not gonna lie, this thing looks very creepy. So the uniform was made of linen that was painted with green, black, brown and cream oil paint to give it that camouflage effect. Apparently this particular costume was from a British army sniper. Sniper, and it's currently on display in the Imperial War Museum in London. In our 8th spot, we have the Splatter Mask. This was a mask that soldiers in tanks would use to protect themselves against remnants of explosions when looking through the viewports. It was given the name Splatter Mask because if a bomb was thrown or a shell explodes, obviously particles would come flying their way and, you know, splatter onto their face. To avoid that, they wore these scary looking masks. The eyes were covered with metal, the mask was leather, and there was a chainmail skirt to cover their mouth and chin. Again, it did its part to protect soldiers, but it looked very creepy. Moving on to number 7, we have the Wall of Faces. After World War I, hundreds of soldiers were left wounded or disfigured, which is where Sir Harold Gillies comes into play. In the early 1900s, he started working on facial reconstruction for these wounded soldiers. Alongside artists, Gillies aimed to make the men look how they did before their injuries. This is a photo taken in Gillies' workshop. Yes, I know it looks scary, this is his wall of masks. Although it does look terrifying, Gillies' work was very important and helped shape modern day plastic surgery and facial reconstruction. By the end of 1919, he managed to produce more than 185 masks. In our sixth spot, we have the foot. On October 12th, 2011, archaeologists, a part of the Alsatian Archaeological Services, were exploring an underground war shelter in France when they came across something pretty horrifying. They found the remains of a German soldier. And by remains, I mean only his foot. He was buried alive after an enemy shell exploded above the tunnel in an attack on March 18th, 1918. As for what happened to the rest of his body, I mean you can only imagine. The men affected by this attack were considered missing in action until word got out about what happened to them. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the field dressing. This is a kit that each soldier carried during the First World War. It contained two dressings, which were comprised of a cotton gauze pad, a bandage, and a safety pin. Obviously, they carried this in case they got injured or their comrades did, and they couldn't get immediate medical attention. The kits also contained detailed instructions on how to open and apply the dressing. The scary thing about this is that the dressing is covered in blood splatter. Whether the soldiers survived treatment is unknown. This kit is now considered an artifact and is on display in Canada's War Museum in Ottawa. Coming in at number 4, we have the damaged helmet. This next item was a French combat helmet. It was sent to a museum directly from the battlefield in France by soldier Major Dana Wright. The scary part is that the helmet features bullet holes. One where the bullet entered the helmet and one where it exited the helmet. Now we don't know how Major Wright got hold of the helmet, nor do we know if the soldier who wore it somehow survived. Although a bullet to the head seems pretty hard to survive. This helmet just highlights the dangers of war and the sad reality that soldiers had to face. Coming in at number 3, we have the shell-shocked soldier and comrades. So the following image is a very popular one on the internet. It went viral because it's a photo of a shell-shocked soldier during 1916. It's a very scary photo. It shows Private Orbit Lindsay smiling at the camera. 
Little backstory, on the morning of September 16th, 1916, he was in a trench cleaning his rifle when he was hit in the neck by sniper fire. Thankfully he survived, but he was stuck laying in the trenches just bleeding out waiting to be rescued. But the original photo actually features three soldiers and some medical orderlies tending to them. One soldier is getting his back treated while blood pours out from a gash on his face. Another is getting his arm treated. This photo just really emphasizes the horror of war. In our second spot, we have the mustard gas victims. Mustard gas was first used in 1917 by the Germans. It is extremely dangerous and poisonous. The effects that it had on soldiers were absolutely terrifying. It causes severe eye and skin burns and terrible skin blisters. Not only that, but when inhaled, it would irritate and burn the soldiers' lungs. Bad exposure could even lead to permanent disfigurement. This photo features Canadian soldiers suffering from mustard gas burns. The one soldier on the right closest to the camera got it really bad. His whole face and arms were burned and blistered. The other soldier behind him only was affected on his left side of his body. Still very scary. And in our number one spot today, we have the life-saving coins. Believe it or not, but six coins in a soldier's pocket managed to save his life after it stopped a bullet from entering his chest. On September 26, 1914, soldier Optitus Bison was out on the battlefields when he was shot by a German soldier. But the bullet managed to ricochet off of the coins he had in his breast pocket. So Bison acted dead and then when the soldier left, he crawled to safety. The ironic part is that the coins were what got him shot in the first place. They were clinging together in his pocket and that gave away his position. But then they were the reason that he lived. Isn't that incredible? Like what are the odds of that? Either he's a very lucky or unlucky soldier. After the war, Bison lived until 1958 when he passed away from heart problems. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have a German bomb. In August of 2015, construction workers in East London found something that I don't think anyone was expecting when they unearthed an unexploded 500 pound German bomb from World War II that, if detonated, could easily destroy the surrounding homes and buildings. Yeah, not terrifying at all, right? Of course, the site was immediately blocked off and 700 people ended up being evacuated until things could return to normal safely. The British Army's Royal Logistics Corps Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit took 24 terrifying hours to make the device safe, which thankfully they were able to do without incident. It is thought that there are likely many more of these scary, undetonated around because they are the result of bombs that were dropped but that failed to go off. Some didn't go off and won't ever because they were made in error, but most of them just had simple technical difficulties that now, if mishandled, could cause the bomb to detonate. It's all terrifying, but thankfully this one didn't go on to do any harm. In our number 9 spot today, we have a war rationing book. When the United States entered the Second World War in late 1941, everyone had to work together to make the most out of the resources they had, which were scarce. Americans who were weren't going off to war still had sacrifices to make. Although they weren't putting their lives on the line, they needed to make adjustments so that the troops who were putting their lives on the line would have everything that they needed. This meant rations, as can be seen in the war ration books, which are relics from a horrible time. Each family at the time would be issued these war rationing books, and each stamp would allow for the purchase of rationed goods, but it would be the quantity and time designated. This isn't the scariest thing in the entire world, but it is a very haunting reminder of a dark time in the past. For many of us, we have never had to live through something like that, and I can't imagine how stressful of a time that would be, not only for this, but of course for many, many reasons. In our number 8 spot today, we have a cake. Just recently in the ruins of a German house that was destroyed in March of 1942, researchers discovered a charred but intact cake. It definitely doesn't look appetizing now, as this cake was burned to a crisp. The artifact, despite being shrunk from heat and charred, is quite preserved, so much so that the swirls of icing that the baker placed on top are still clearly visible. The cake was found in the basement of a home that collapsed following an attack that was carried out by the British Royal Air Force as a retaliation for the 1940 
that was carried out by the Germans on the English city of Coventry. This not only reminds us of the horrible time that was World War II, but it is also a reminder of how these attacks were carried out on unsuspecting people in their own homes. This wasn't just the reality this one time, that was the reality all over the world. Because the attack that destroyed this home happened on Saturday, March 28th of that year, it is thought that the home's owner, Johann Warm, who was a local merchant, might have been preparing for a celebration commemorating Palm Sunday. This is just one small example of the realities of war, especially one that has the magnitude of World War II. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Gustav guns. During World War II, Adolf was eager to invade France, but was unable to because of a real physical barrier that was called the Maginot Line, which was what was standing between him and the rest of Western Europe. Because of his impatience and desire to do evil, he demanded that a new weapon be created that would be able to easily pierce the concrete. In 1941, after France fell, a German steelmaker and arms manufacturer, Frederick Krupp AG, began building what is known as the Gustav gun. It was a four-story tall, 155-foot long that weighed 1,350 tons and it shot 10,000 pound shells from its 98 foot barrel. Like that is absolutely insane and there is simply no reason for anyone, let alone one of the worst people to have ever lived, to need this kind of a weapon. While the sheer size of this thing obviously helped a lot with its insane power, it's also what led to its downfall. The gun of course could only be transferred by rail because imagine trying to put that thing on a plane. Physics says absolutely not. This left it out in the open and it was an easy target for the allied bombers flying overhead, which left the project being scrapped within a year. Now the different models that were made and what is left of them is all that remains for this terrifying creation. In our number 6 spot today we have the fire cart bell. This is a bell that comes from the Japanese city of Aomori, which was by American B-29 bombers who flew in from the Mariana Islands. This took place on June 28th of 1945 and the explosives were M-74 napalm filled bombs. Those in the city had only hand pulled carts with water pumps to fight the fires which of course soon left them ravaging the mostly wooden city completely out of control. This led to 1,700 Japanese residents losing their lives and the destruction of 18,000 homes. Seaman First Class Robert McClintock from Seattle, Washington was assigned to the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey in 1945, and he helped with the report for the city. This meant that after the attacks and the surrender of Japan, he was one of the first in the city. Through his work, he ended up getting along so well with those who lived in the city that they presented him with one of the bells from their carts as a symbol of kindness between the Japanese and the Americans. These bells were used to call the residents out into the streets to help fight the fires and try and save the city, which we of course know unfortunately didn't work. This bell, while in some ways is a symbol of peace, is also a symbol of the entire campaign, which was extremely deadly. It reminds us of the human side to everything that went on during this era and time, as it sometimes can be forgotten. We have the Norden site. If you don't know, a site is what is used in military aircrafts in order to be able to drop accurately. The Norden site was one that existed during the World War II era, and it is said to have been a highly sought after piece of technology. In fact, it was apparently so top secret that those in the aircrafts with them had to swear an oath to protect the secrets of the device by destroying it before it could fall into the hands of the enemy, even if it meant sacrificing their own lives. That is next level secrecy. The reason is because it was claimed that this site had the ability to place a bomb in a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet away. Not only is that a strangely specific example, but it was also greatly exaggerated. In reality, the piece of technology was a pretty complicated machine that consisted of a ton of gear wheels and ball bearings, but the major flaw of it is that, when out of proper calibration, it was likely to create inaccuracies. This is of course a huge problem when it comes to something like and the machine could fall out of calibration through something common like the turbulence of the aircraft on the journey. Certainly not foolproof by any means. In our number 4 spot today we have My Gal Sal. My Gal Sal is a B-17 which is a strategic bomber that was developed in the 1930s. In fact, My Gal Sal was one of the first of thousands of B-17s to fly the northern air route from the United States to England. This plane specifically has its own special story attached to it though, as on June 27th, 1942, due to terrible weather conditions, this B-17 plane had to make an emergency landing on an ice cap in Greenland. Of course, this is a less than ideal location, especially for the crew that was on board. Somehow the crew was able to survive the whole ordeal that ended up lasting 10 days. They had to 
find a way to get the aircraft's radio working again as it was broken, and they finally managed to do it and get an SOS signal sent through, which is of course what thankfully led to their rescue. The plane, however, did not have the same fate for quite some while. I can't imagine it's exactly easy to recover a plane from anywhere, let alone an ice cap, so my gal Sal sat in this location for 50 years. Eventually, however, they did recover it and restore it before it made its way to its new home in the museum. Thankfully, this is one story on our list that doesn't have a horrifying ending, but it is definitely still an artifact that reminds us all of that scary time for those on board the plane, my gal Sal. In our number three spot today, we have a letter. This letter is one that was written by Bernard Madison Hurd on December 16th, 1943, and it was a letter sent to his parents who were in New Orleans, Louisiana. The letter starts off how you'd expect. He gives his parents an update on where he is, and he explains that his next duty station is in the submarine, the USS Tilefish, which he calls, quote, a real beauty. He talks about receiving a letter from his brother, who was also in the Navy. He talks about enjoying spending time with his mother while on his leave, and he wished his father a speedy recovery from an illness. This is all what you'd expect a letter to contain, and it really captures a moment in time for Bernard. And while this letter does exactly that, it also doesn't even come close to letting you know exactly who Bernard is. He was a career Navy man who enlisted in 1940 and remained on active duty until the mid 1950s. He served on plenty of ships and was an elite combat veteran, but he wasn't like the other sailors of his time. Bernard was a black man and he was confined to service in the stewards branch. Because of racism and segregation, Bernard was limited to his seagoing domestic role and had to clean up after other officers, serve their food, and was basically at their beck and call. This wasn't much different than the society he had left behind. This letter doesn't tell us any of that, however. The letter simply tells us of a man who missed his family. The letter captures one single moment of Bernard's incredible, long, and storied service to the country that didn't treat him fairly. This certainly isn't the most terrifying artifact on this list, but it certainly is one of the most important. In our number two spot today, we have Michael McShane's life jacket. In 1939, Michael McShane was headed out to his home of Ireland from Detroit, Michigan, in order to collect his winnings from a sweepstakes that was designed to help fund hospitals. On his return trip back to America, he was booked on the SS Athena, which departed from Glasgow, Scotland on September 1st, 1939. In August of that same year, Europe was moving closer and closer to war, and this meant that people were desperate to get out. Because of this, the Donaldson Line did everything they could to get as many passengers as possible onto the SS Athena. They were putting four people into two-person rooms, and places like the lounges and libraries were being turned into bunk rooms. The boat was packed, but people were fleeing. Once the boat set out to sea after traveling just 1,600 yards, the first spread of torpedoes were fired in the Battle of the Atlantic, and one single torpedo struck the side of the SS Athena, just as Michael McShane and the rest of the passengers were sitting down for dinner. The explosion immediately destroyed the engine and fire room, which took the life of almost every man who was on the station. It also destroyed the staircase to the third class dining room, which ended up proving to be fatal for many of the passengers eating their dinner. The passengers who weren't immediately harmed sprung into action and went to retrieve their life jackets, including Michael, who was then put aboard lifeboat 14A. This story has so much more to it that unfortunately I don't have time to cover, but it is certainly worth reading about. But to make this long story short, in the end, lifeboat 14A was the first of four that was rescued. Out of the 1,418 civilians and sailors aboard that ship that day, 112 were lost during the sinking and the rescue, but Michael managed to survive. For the rest of his life, he kept the life jacket he had worn that day, and after his death, his family donated it to the National World War II Museum. The jacket not only reminds us of his survival, but it is also a relic that was there for the very first shots of the Battle of the Atlantic, which was a critical part of the war. It's a link to Michael and also to the beginning of the Second World War. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the SS Walling Bar 2. Quite recently, just a few years ago, just off of the east coast of Australia, the wreckage of the ship was discovered. This ship sank in 1943 during the war after being struck by two torpedoes sent from a Japanese submarine. The ship sank in just minutes, with only five crew members surviving and the rest of the 32 on board sadly losing their lives. The acting minister for veterans at the time, Jeff Lee, said, quote, This secret has been hidden at the bottom of the deep sea for decades, and this find will give some closure for the descendants and relatives of the 32 people who lost their lives. Another interesting fact about the sinking of this ship is that when it went down, it was carrying boxes of butter and bacon, which then went on to be washed up on the shores. This led to a huge influx of cake baking, which in this time was normally restricted because of the food rationing. In our number nine spot, 
Pot today we have a German bomb. This is one discovery that was definitely found accidentally. In August of 2015, construction workers in East London found something that I don't think anyone was expecting when they unearthed an unexploded 500 pound German bomb from World War II that, if detonated, could easily destroy the surrounding homes and buildings. Yeah, not terrifying at all, right? Of course, this site was immediately blocked off and 700 people ended up being evacuated until things could return to normal safely. The British Army's Royal Logistics Corps Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit took 24 terrifying hours to make this device safe, which thankfully they were able to do without incident. It is thought that there are likely many more of these scary undetonated bombs around because they are the result of bombs that were dropped but failed to go off. Some didn't go off and won't ever because they were made in error, but most of them just had simple technical difficulties that now, if mishandled, could cause the bomb to detonate. It's all terrifying, but thankfully this one didn't go on to do any harm. In our number 8 spot today, we have the USS Lexington. In 2018, researchers were able to locate the wreckage of the USS Lexington, which was a US aircraft carrier that was used in the Second World War. This discovery came at the bottom of the Coral Sea, about 800 kilometers off of the coast of Eastern Australia. It is said that the Lexington is one of the capital ships that were lost during the war. It was originally commissioned as a battle cruiser, but in 1925, it was instead launched as an aircraft carrier. From May 4th to May 8th, 1942, this ship and the USS Yorktown faced off against three Japanese carriers in the Battle of the Coral Sea. While both the Lexington and the Yorktown put up a great fight, on May 8th, the Lexington ended up being damaged when it was hit by multiple torpedoes and bombs. This was already bad, but things got much worse when a secondary explosion led to raging fires, which then led to the crew abandoning ship. On the evening of May 8th, in order to prevent the ship from being captured, it was scuttled or deliberately sunk by the USS Phelps, but not until the surviving 2,770 crew members and officers were rescued. Sadly, this was not every member, however, as it is said that 216 people lost their lives in this battle. In our number 7 spot today, we have the USS Nevada. This ship for many years was deemed unsinkable, but after a long resume of battle, that unfortunately wasn't the case. The USS Nevada, during the 1941 surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, was the only ship to get away in one piece, albeit barely. It took years to repair the ship, but once done, she was returned to battle in 1944 to support the Normandy invasion, and a year after that, it assisted in two more invasions and two atomic bomb tests. After the war ended, they finally decided that, hey, this gal's seen enough, and they decided to retire her, but not before using her as target practice. It took a lot of ammo and five days to do it, but they finally sank the ship with a torpedo being the final strike. After the sinking, the Navy wasn't exactly sure where it would end up. I mean, it was over 15,000 feet below the surface of the ocean, so it really could have gone anywhere. Cut all the way to 2020 during an expedition by Ocean Infinity and Search Inc, and the ship was finally once again located. She ended up just 65 nautical miles southwest of Pearl Harbor. In our number six spot today, we have the aircraft wreck. In 2017, divers discovered not only the remains of a wreck of an American B-24, the Tulsa America bomber that was downed just off of the shores of Croatia in 1944, but inside of the wreck, they also found the remains of those who lost their lives in the incident. This is one of many aircrafts, mostly bombers like this one, that were downed in the area, and that is because of the fact that there was an important Allied airbase there. The wreck was found resting on the seabed about 40 meters down, and there were bones discovered inside, which are said to belong to the pilot and co pilot of the aircraft. They were able to find them by sifting through the sediment underneath the cabin, and their remains were then placed into bags in order to be lifted out of the water and brought to the ship for further analysis. This is most certainly quite a grim discovery, but it allows those who lost their lives to be returned home, and it allows the relatives some sort of closure with their tragic losses. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Backyard Discovery. When I read this story, I was definitely concerned, but it also made me laugh so much. Many of us can understand that uncomfortable feeling of having an issue, but not wanting to bother anyone else about it until the time is right. Sometimes this is just instinct, sometimes this is just politeness, and sometimes you absolutely need to say screw politeness and bother someone because it's an emergency. Nearing the end of 2017, someone in East Poland was digging in their backyard when they accidentally unearthed an unexploded grenade that dates all the way back to World War II. 
Because it was around the holidays, he didn't want to disturb anyone who might be enjoying time and food with their families, so instead of calling the police, he put it in a bucket filled with sand and placed it in his shed until after the holidays were over. Once the proper people were informed, the area where he found the explosive was examined where more dangerous objects were also found. In the end, military personnel came by to take care of and properly and securely destroy these dangerous findings. In our number 4 spot today, we have rocket propelled mortar shells. While crews were just doing their job casually clearing up the roadside ditches in northeast Poland, they made a shocking discovery. They uncovered what appeared to be two unexploded explosive devices. After experts were called in and further research was done, these two items turned out to be German 28 centimeter Nebel Warfer shells. Specialists were then able to come and secure the site and the weapons so that they could be taken away for a scheduled detonation which occurred the following day. The weapons are rocket propelled mortar shells that were used with a weapon that would fire them in groups of six, with their maximum range being around 2,200 meters. In our number three spot today, we have a grave. In March of 2018, archaeologists in West Poland made a dark discovery when they found a grave that contained the remains of German soldiers that dates back to the Second World War. To make this discovery even more grim, the soldiers were all bound with a blue cord. According to experts, the remains are from 1945, and while the cord looks extremely eerie, they explained that it was likely just used to transport them to the place of burial. According to Archaeofeed.com, quote, along with the remains, researchers of the Pomost Association, who initially found archive documents that led to the discovery of the grave, discovered parts of military uniforms, buttons, and German soldier tags. The researchers did not find any marks that would indicate execution of the soldiers. One of the individuals had his legs broken in a few places. According to archaeologists, the soldiers died in battle, and then they would have later been transported to this spot. In our number two spot today, we have the crash site. During a two month long excavation that was done by a team of soldiers, sailors, and airmen, as well as civilians, they were able to recover and retrieve some human remains that might belong to the long lost American air crews of World War II airplanes. The team worked near an island which, during the war, was the site of a Japanese submarine base and a seaplane ramp. This area was the target of a ton of B 24 bombings and raids by the United States in 1944 and 1945. The team sifted through the sand in the area using large baskets in order to search for the remains. Now that they've located the remains, what happens next? Well, the remains will be analyzed to see if they match the profile of any of the missing service members that are associated with that crash site. If so, then their surviving next of kin will be notified. In our number one spot today, we have the Chuck Lagoon. This lagoon was the site of one of the main bases for Japan during the war, but in 1944, the United States launched an attack on it. During this, 60 ships were sunk, around 250 planes were brought down. It is likely that researchers knew about the significance of this area, but we didn't really get a good look at it for some 70 years. A photographer who goes by the name of Super Jolly went down into this less than jolly area to snap photos of everything that can be seen down there. He called this shoot one of the scariest dives he's ever done in his life, and I can completely understand why. The area is filled with human skulls, gas masks, and bullets, and many of the artifacts down here are extremely well preserved, which is great for research, but also just so haunting. This area most definitely serves as a haunting reminder of the realities of a world war.